Has there ever been a time where you wondered about something and thought to yourself, wow, I really should know this? Whether it be something as serious as the water shortage our world is facing or the future of digital real estate. Or maybe something as strange as the origins of the Mandela effect or what does Michelin have to do with food or if lizard people actually exist. Whatever it may be, we got you covered. But that's not all. We turn it into one big drinking game. Welcome to Shots and Thoughts, the internet's only educational improv comedy game show involving shots of liquor and D20s. We're learning what you should already know so you don't have to. We are. We are. We are cultivate. 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 We are cultivate. Hello and welcome to Ye Old Crime, where we discuss the funny, strange, and obscure crimes of yesteryear. I'm your host, Lindsay Valenti, and with me is my sister and co-host, Maddie Stengel. Hello. Hi. How's it going? It's going. I feel that in my bones. Mm-hmm. I feel that in my bones as well. <gasps> we have good bones. We do. None of those hollow bird bones. None of those bird bones. This is attack on you, birds. <laughs> this is an anti-bird podcast. Birds aren't real. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That was really loud. This is week three of Black History Month. And sure is. we are going to be discussing Oscar James Dunn. That's a good name. It is a good name. Information was pulled from the following sources, a 2022 The French Quarterly Magazine article by Kim Welsh, 2021 The Historic New Orleans Collection article by Nick Weldon, 2017 Atlas Obscura article by Chelsea Adams, 2017 New Orleans Tripod article, 2017 The New Orleans Tribune article, 2011 University of New Orleans Scholar Works article by Brian Mitchell, 2013 64 Parishes article by Charles Vincent, 2008 Black Past article by Herbert G. Ruffin II, Ooh, fancy name. Good name. And Wikipedia. All right. And links to all of these articles will be included in the show notes. Wow. Wow. <laughs> if you want a playlist of all our episodes on YouTube, Click the link in our show notes or in our link tree and subscribe today for not only a list of our full catalog, but a separate list as well, just of our Can You Crack the Cramp Word segments. So it's in New Orleans! Yay, Nola! Yep. Oscar James Dunn was born sometime in 1826, enslaved in New Orleans. James Dunn had moved to New Orleans as a free African American in 1819 prior to Oscar's birth, and his mother, like Oscar, was also enslaved. He had a younger sister named Jane. So because his mother was enslaved, he was not born a slave, despite his father was free? Yep. That's stupid. Mm -hmm. Aren't men supposed to be worth more for lots of things, even? It doesn't matter if you're... If you're a child. Damn. Well, then what, what use is male privilege <laughs> if you can't, can't be born not a slave? That's shitty. Yeah. Boo. Okay. On February 5th, 1831, James had earned enough money working as a carpenter for James H. Caldwell to purchase his wife Maria, age 35, her son Oscar, age 5, and their daughter Jane, age 2 from their enslaver, George P. Bowers. Wow, that must have been a lot of money. He was able to purchase all three for the sum of $800, or around $27,000 today. Wow. Which was paid over the course of five months. He let him pay him in increments. Mm-hmm. That's, honestly, that's one of the nicer things I've heard in uh, southern enslaved areas. Mm-hmm. In Louisiana, of all places. Yeah, hopefully no interest. 
At this time, James would have been around 36 or slightly younger, as it's Mm. believed he was born sometime in the late 1790s. Okay. He petitioned for his family's emancipation almost two years later. So... So when he bought them, he technically owned them. They were not (gasps) free. That's really messed up. Yeah. So you can't just buy buy freedom. You're buying slaves and then you have to apply yes. to allow them to be free. Yes. After you own them. Yes. So it's just another grab for more money for the state city, essentially. Yep. Great. Wow, that's a fun little piece of something I didn't know about. Did you mm-hmm. know that? That you had to pay for freedom twice? I didn't really know that. I mean, I I'm sure it was different depending on what state you were in, but Yeah. That's super messed up. You had to apply for emancipation. Wow. It had to be registered with the state. So you couldn't just declare them free. You had to... It had to be registered. Wow. Horrible. Okay, continue. Yep. Following their emancipation, which they gained several years before the American Civil War, James continued his carpentry work for Mr. Caldwell, who he indentured himself to to assist him in establishing New Orleans' first American theater. And Maria took up work running a boarding house for actors and actresses in the city. Their combined income was enough to send Oscar and his sister Jane to a private school. On May 9th, 1834, the boarding house that James and Maria owned and operated was broken into by two men named Frederick and John Proctor, along with several others. Great. Did these people happen to be white? Yeah. Wow. Crazy. Surprise, right? Great. They forced their way into the home armed with, quote, clubs, sticks, knives, dirks, which are a long dagger, swords, and pistols, end quote, and had entered the home for the express purpose of murdering both of them. Why? And why a sword? He just got a sword? I don't know. A military sword? I don't know. This is the South. Okay, so that would have been terrifying. Yep. The mob of men beat the pair savagely in front of the terrified boarders that had been staying at the home, and a doctor was called on following the attack to tend to James' serious wounds. Oh my god. No reason was given for the attack in court on December 11th, 1834, where the men were charged with assault and battery, along with several others, including James Anderson, William Nelson, James Rourke, Francisco Lorette, Henry Huard, Lande Ferrier, J. G. Asher, Richard Terrell, Benjamin Bott, Simeon Carrier, Urson Brow, Thomas Jenkins, Thomas Milani, Patrick Summers, and John Warren. The group of men consisted of Latin and Anglo-American citizens, as well as two free Black Americans. Great. Awesome. They all fucking suck. Yep. That is so many people. Oh, my God. And for no reason. Just jealous of their success. It's the only thing I can think of. Yep. The success that they thought they were owed. Something. Yeah, beating the shit out of somebody's really going to do that for you. Great. Yeah. Going back to Oscar, very little is known of the first nine years of his life prior to James purchasing him. Much of what we know about his life comes from his longtime friend, John Parson. He states that much of Oscar's early life was spent attending school where he received an, quote, ordinary English education, end quote. Nice. This clarification was likely made as at this time, New Orleans largely consisted of French-speaking and free Anglo-Africans. Oh, yeah. That makes sense. So they'd be like, what kind of education did he get? Yeah. Gotta love that French tension. Yep. <laughs> Between the English. <laughs> Historians Karen Cospell and H.E. Sturx believe that it's likely Oscar attended the Grimble Bell School in Landry Parish, a large school for free Anglo-Africans in the area. Tuition and board was $15 a month, or between $400 to $500 today, Whoa. which is very close to what Oscar believed his parents paid for his education. That's insane. And part of why he had to go to a private school is because there was no integration yet in the public schools to allow that makes sense free people of color to attend school. Yeah, they wanted to make it as tough as possible. 
for them to get a decent education. Yes. So they had to fight for it. Yes. Well, good on his parents for fighting for it. I'm sure that was quite a hardship. Like, that would be a hardship for me now, Mm -hmm. spending $500 a month on schooling. Yeah. But that's also me out of touch. I don't know how much school costs. (laughs) I really don't. (laughs) I couldn't imagine sending my kids, two kids, to school for that much money. $1,000 a month. I am also not exceedingly wealthy. So. Right. Oscar was noted as having a passion for learning, particularly reading, and this passion would fuel his later ambitions in life and be recognized as a defining character trait following his death. He loved to read. He was <laughs> just a reading, just an, a, a, a voracious reader. Little little bookworm with his little nook. Oscar was forced to quit school at the age of 14, as during this time in history, many children were expected to enter an apprenticeship at the yeah. end of their schooling with either an artisan or a tradesman. That makes sense. His father had Oscar apprentice with master plasterers who lived in the city, George Patterson, and either David or Samuel Jameson. This move allowed Oscar to learn a lucrative trade that would put him on the same level as Afro-Creoles working in the city. Okay. Under their tutelage, Oscar learned the trade of plastering, and after reaching a level where he could work the trade well enough on his own, he went to work for a man named Thomas Dryden. Thomas, now a plasterer by trade, used to be an accomplished singer in New Orleans, and it was Thomas that introduced Oscar to music and became his music instructor. Nice. Following this, some sort of incident that I couldn't locate the full details of took place between the two men okay. and it ended in oscar leaving thomas's employ and seeking work elsewhere okay so hopefully it was amicable but you can't really tell either way i can't i have no idea okay it sounded like it was amicable but i don't know what the actual incident was right oscar continued his musical pursuits under the tutelage of an italian named torna who taught him guitar to the point that Oscar was soon so skilled that he was able to start his own profession as a music instructor. Mm. He continued to take on students until an incident that took place in 1860 involving another free African-American named Thomas J. Martin. Okay. I don't like the term incident. Yeah. Great. (laughs) I'm going to make my description of the Martin scandal very brief. Okay. And just give like the Cliff Notes version. But could this be its own episode? It's just, it's very long winded if I went into all the details. Okay. Essentially, Thomas, so this other man, was in a relationship with the white daughter of a retired actress. Thomas was, as I said, a free African American. And the pair had a child together. Okay. When the mother confronted him regarding their relationship, saying he quote-unquote absconded with her daughter, he threatened to burn her house down, prompting her to report him to the police. Uh, Probably not the best way to de-escalate that, but you know. Yep. Okay. Coming in hot, I get it. Yep. Upon his arrest, he denied fathering the child, and a number of allegations came out that Thomas had seduced and slept with all of his female students a total that was around 30 who were mainly young women belonging to middle class or higher socioeconomic status in white families. So this wasn't just him being in love with this woman. It was him being a philanderer. Yes. That sucks. I was kind of hoping that he was just really in love with her and fighting for love. And he's just fighting for his downstairs friend. Great. Great. Perfect. This proved to be true when several photos and love letters from his white admirers were discovered. Oh, great. This also prompted a manhunt for his supposed quote unquote accomplice, which oh, resulted no. in a crowd of around 2,000 angry individuals gathering in Lafayette Square on the evening of June 27th, 1860, with the aim of locating the second Lothario. Okay, that sounds like a bad group to be captured by. Yeah. Later that evening, a mob of over a dozen men headed to the parish prison 
and were only dispersed after the sheriff fired three shots into the air to warn them off. They were likely going to the prison to, in case you didn't guess it, lynch Thomas. Yep. So, just to yep. make that abundantly clear. They wanted to lynch somebody. Yep. And if they yep. couldn't find the other guy... They'd go with number one. They knew where one of them was. Yep. Wow. Not wanting to put himself in any sort of danger or connect himself in any way with Thomas Martin, Oscar chose to end his music career and return to the trade of plastering. Really good idea. Yep. Such a good idea. Following the end of the Civil War in April of 1865, Oscar saw the potential in aiding in the emancipation of slaves, and as a former enslaved himself, he felt it his duty to do his part. He opened his own law office and assisted the recently freed with labor contracts so they could continue to work and get properly compensated for it. How do you just start your own law practice? I'm know. sorry. I knew he was good at reading from that private school, but like, how do you just open a law office? I don't, I don't know. This, this dude is amazing. He quite literally is a jack of all trades. Quite literally. Under the mandates of the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands, not to mention the Department of the Gulf, all freed enslaved peoples who wished to gain employment on plantations needed to have voluntary labor contracts. Okay. Oscar's office provided said contracts and connected laborers with people looking for their services. Nice. So kind of like a placement agency. Yeah. It's like a temp agency for really horrible work. <laughs> for, for day laborers, yes. Yeah. Oscar's office was the first of its kind in the city and held the monopoly thanks to his involvement in charities and associations like the Freedmen's Aid Society nice. until other offices opened up looking to provide agricultural labor. Don't let them do it. Keep that monopoly. <laughs> well, go, Oscar, go. <laughs> Oscar spoke at a meeting of the Freedmen's Aid Association, warning its followers to be wary of who they went to as not all offices had the laborer's best interest at heart. Of course not. It's just another way to get easy cash. This happens all the time in every industry. Yep. There's always that one person that turns into 10, 20, 1,000. Yep. Oscar's office received 15 to 20 calls a day looking for laborers throughout the state of Louisiana. Wow. And he further stated that he was able to secure around $15 a month for males, around $280 today, and ten dollars a month for females, or around two hundred dollars today, which was almost a double the minimum amount that was outlined in General Order Twenty Three for payment to freed laborers. Yeah, I mean, ten dollars now. Like I wasn't making ten dollars an hour with my first job, so that's this is fifteen dollars a month. It's not an hour, oh, but like a month. Yeah, but still, but even like, still, that's like almost double what the national average was. That's amazing. Or what the minimum was to pay. In in the South. In the South. Wow. You go, Glen Coco. Yeah. Outside of this, little is known about Oscar's private life. We do know that he was a member of the ancient York Masons. Stop. This dude's a Freemason. Stop. That's why he's made of witchcraft and can do whatever he wants. Yeah. And had been accepted into the order on November 2nd, 1852, at the age of 26. Get it. And joined one of the first black lodges in Richmond. In 1863, Oscar was able to pass the first, second, and third degrees of Masonic crafts. I have no idea what that means. Sounds cool. And he was actively involved in the Eureka Grand Lodge as well. That same year, he was part of five separate committees within the Grand Lodge, before he was elected to the post of Senior Grand Warden at the end of the year. He's so ambitious. And like literally everything he does. Yeah. He just, he just goes whole hog. It's crazy. Yep. In 1864, he took up the post, but also retained his position of Worshipful Master at the Richmond Lodge. What? By the end of the year, on December 26th, 1864... Oscar was installed as most worshipful grandmaster of the Eureka Lodge. His involvement with the Freemasons not only provided him with invaluable leadership experience, 
but also allowed him to make connections with a number of political figures throughout the state. Wow, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. In 1865, Oscar started courting a widow by the name of Ellen Boyd Marshall, who was the former wife of Peter Marshall, who owned the home that Oscar had once boarded at prior to Peter's death. After a year of courtship, Oscar married Ellen on December 27, 1866, at the age of 40. He also nice. legally adopted her three children from her previous marriage, Fanny, Lizzie, and Charles. That's so nice. Ellen had been born in Cincinnati, Ohio in 1826 to Henry Boyd, who was an established carpenter, businessman, and he had escaped enslavement. She married Peter Marshall on May 11, 1842, and the following year left Ohio in 1843 at the age of 17 with her husband and moved to New Orleans to take up a teaching post. Oscar began boarding with the Marshalls six years later in 1849 and lived there for almost 12 years before moving into the building that housed his business. Nice. So they were actually the same age when they got married. That's awesome. Oscar's political career started when he became an active member in the suffrage movement, signing a petition that rights should be granted to the African-American males mm -hmm. in the state of Louisiana who had been manumissioned prior to the Civil War. You're darn right. I mean, that's bare minimum. Yeah. Please. <laughs> yeah. Louisiana's African-American population did gain back some of their rights following the 1864 Constitution, that was passed so the state could rejoin the Union following the war. According to the new Constitution, African Americans gained their freedom from enslavement, earned the right to purchase and own property, make contracts, and testify in court. Because remember, if you were yeah. enslaved, you weren't allowed to testify in court. Yeah, you were always guilty because yep. you couldn't fight for yourself. Or if you were a witness to something, your testimony yeah. wouldn't be considered. Yeah, it wouldn't matter. I remember yep. that. God. Oscar was appointed to the City Council of New Orleans, and in June 1865, an association named Friends of Universal Suffrage formed, which Oscar joined as a representative of the city's second district and became one of its 24 original members. They fought tirelessly to secure newly freed men the right to vote. Nice. On the other hand... Democrats fed the public with misinformation, such as that if the African-American population registered to vote, it could be used against them in the event of a military draft, or that they could be lynched when they went to vote, which made it difficult for the Friends to gain any headway in helping the large African-American population of the city. God, I hate people so much. Yeah. So it's all bad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Regardless, Oscar continued to run for office and won a seat in the city's fourth district at the Universal Suffrage State Convention in 1865. Already extremely active in the community, he also held leadership roles in other organizations, such as the Louisiana Association for the Benefit of Colored Orphans, the Advisory Committee of the Freedmen's Saving and Trust Company of New Orleans, the Freedmen's Aid Association, which he supported with his legal practice, yeah. and he pushed for the establishment of the People's Bakery. Aww. The People's Bakery allowed freed African Americans to learn new skills so they could contribute to their community's economic growth. That's so cool. Right? Man, this dude's all right. I like him a lot. In 1867, Oscar was appointed to the Board of Aldermen of New Orleans, and he chaired a committee that set the age for children attending public schools to between 6 to 18 years, regardless of the color of their skin. Nice. In January of 1868, Republicans met to elect gubernatorial candidates for Louisiana. At the time, the Republican Party was divided into two camps. The pure radicals, who supported better conditions for freed African Americans, mm -hmm. in which Oscar was a member, Mm -hmm. and the white Republicans, who yeah. essentially wanted to secure the black vote only so they could get a seat of power and then appoint a quote-unquote docile African-American into lower-level positions so they could easily be controlled. Yep, let's just satiate you, pat you on the head. 
Use your power. Yep. Yep. Oscar was nominated by PBS Pinchback for the post of Lieutenant Governor on January 4th, 1868. He had serious reservations about running on the same ticket as Henry C. Warmoth, a white Republican running for governor, whom he was concerned only wanted to use him to secure the black vote. Probably. I mean, there's a pretty good likelihood there. Yeah. He was also, I think, 20 years younger than Oscar, is what I read. So he was mm. like, he's like, who's some this years old? Stupid young gun kid. Mm-hmm. Oscar won the post of lieutenant governor on June 13th, 1868, and presided over the Louisiana state legislature. During the, wow. his time as lieutenant governor, he presided over the ratification of the 14th Amendment which grants citizenship to anyone born or naturalized in the United States, including those who were formerly enslaved. That's so cool. That had to have been a good feeling. Mm -hmm. Oscar, as I've mentioned throughout this episode, fought hard for universal male suffrage, civil rights, and the integration of public schools and education for all children, regardless of their race, which is astonishing if you think about it, given that he was elected just three years after the end of the Civil War in the Reconstructionist South. Right. Like that, that says so much mm -hmm. as to who he was. Mm -hmm. Wow. There was a quote in the New, or the New Orleans Times newspaper where local Democrats described Oscar as, quote, the taint of honesty and of a scrupulous regard for the official properties is a serious drawback in innervating a reproach on the lieutenant governor, end quote. <laughs> A.K.A. That means he's so honest and fair that it's just annoying. <laughs> like, he's just so principled that it's just like, come on, guy. Whereas... Yeah. At this time, a lot of politicians are really corrupt. Right. They don't, they don't want to work. They don't want to do stuff. And he's making them do stuff for the good of the people. And they're annoyed they can't pin anything on him mm -hmm. to, like, smear him. Right. Henry Warmoth, who won the seat of governor for Louisiana, would go on to betray Oscar, just as he predicted, by vetoing the Civil Rights Act of 1866 that would have offered further protections for African-Americans. Heaven forbid. Mm. Hey. <laughs> Willie didn't like that either. I know, Willie didn't like that either. He was like, <laughs> I hate that guy. As you can imagine, this move didn't earn Henry any admirers, especially amongst the vast black population of Louisiana. Mm -hmm. It severely divided the Republican Party, resulting in separate police forces and separate conventions. Really? Mm -hmm. Wow. It got so bad, there was talk of an impeachment trial. I bet. Yeah. I mean, I'd impeach the guy. He sucks. Yeah. In 1869, at the age of 43, Oscar traveled to Washington, D.C. to sit for a portrait by famed Civil War battlefield photographer Matthew Brady. Today, it is one of the few photos of Oscar that still exists. While there on April 2nd, 1869... He met with President Ulysses S. Grant in the White House, who, if rumors are to be believed, was considering asking Oscar to be his vice president. Really? Mm-hmm. That's big. Mm hmm If you think that Oscar didn't encounter blatant racism during his travels north during his political career, <laughs> you are so wrong. You're an idiot. You're dumb, and I'm not a... <laughs> You have no idea how history works. <laughs> yeah, you don't know how people work. God. He would still experience some sort of racism if he had a yep. political career today. During his travels, Hebrews refused a sleeping car on the train. And while his white companions were granted hotel rooms during a stop in Philadelphia, mm -hmm. he was forced to share quarters with the staff. Yeah, sounds right. Yep. Brokers at the New York Stock Exchange even hired a barber to impersonate Oscar as a joke during his visit, and they were never publicly disciplined for this transgression. Of course not. Why, why would they? Yeah. And that's just a handful of the stuff during this, like, one trip. It's just a like, joke, right? You can't yeah. take a joke? <laughs> On December 9th, 1869, 
Oscar purchased a home on Canal Street, which at the time straddled the line between the Anglo-American suburb and the Afro-Creole Faubourg. In January of 1871, Oscar and Ellen enrolled their children in the first integrated public school in New Orleans. I bet he was so excited for that. I'm sure he was. Because that's something his parents wanted for him. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. I ho- oh, that's so cool. Mm-hmm. I, hope they, I hope they understood the significance of that. I bet they did, if that was their dad. I'm sure, I'm sure they did. That's so cool. In 1871, at the age of 45, Oscar became violently ill following a public dinner he attended. (gasps) He died quite suddenly two days later at home on November 22nd, 1871. He was poisoned. His official cause of death, as noted on his death certificate, was, quote, congestion to the brain and lungs, end quote, Mm -hmm. or simply natural causes. Absolutely not. According to Nick Warden, who works for the Historic New Orleans Collection, all of Oscar's symptoms were consistent with arsenic poisoning. Yep. Vomiting and shivering. And three out of the seven doctors that examined him refused to sign off on his official cause of death, suspecting it was murder. Yeah, it probably was. A spokesperson for the family declined having an autopsy conducted. Well, they probably just didn't want that nastiness. It would have only gotten way worse for them. Yeah. And they probably just wanted to grieve. Yeah. And he wouldn't have wanted them to do it, too. He would have been yeah. just like, let it let it be. Yeah. Needless to say, his supporters in New Orleans were shocked at the news of his son passing. His funeral was held the next day, November 23rd, 1871, at St. James African Methodist Episcopal Church. The next day? Yeah. That's so yeah. fast? Well, I don't think they did embalming. Oh. Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. So they had to do it fast. hmm And the procession following it was one of the biggest in the city's history. Around 50,000 people joined the second line, which is essentially a parade that included jazz bands, which started from his home on Canal Street all the way to Magazine Street, which covers 12 city blocks. Before proceeding to the cemetery. On the day of his funeral, the Louisiana State House, public schools, and all federal buildings were closed as a sign of respect. Good. The first eulogy given at his funeral was delivered by James Lynch, who was the African American Secretary of State in Mississippi. It read in part, quote, There now lies before us the remains of the first colored man who ever held an executive office in this country. The occasion is in no sense an ordinary one, and ours is no cold tribute of respect. It is the struggle of the heart to express the agony of the public mind. Here lies powerless in death, the great representative of our race. It seems as if we were in a battlefield, our ranks broken and our flags trailing in the dust. Adversity is upon us, but our trust is in God, the same God in whom he trusted and who has raised him higher and higher unto himself. As the news spreads over the nation, every colored man's heart will bleed. Mm. The affliction is the nation's, and the nation will mourn. In Lieutenant Governor Dunn, it has been shown that the colored man, crushed to the earth by a tyrannic power, could, when his shackles were broken, rise to dignity, usefulness, and the loftiest patriotism, end quote. Wonderfully said. Mm Mm-hmm. Oscar is interred in St. Louis Cemetery No. 3, and mourners lingered at his tomb until dusk to discuss his life and the contributions he had made to better the lives of all members of Louisiana. Here's where things get worse. No, don't tell me he was like a lizard person or something. No, he was not a lizard person. (laughs) I was like, no, Oscar, why? No, no. Two weeks after his death, on a cold December day in 1871, a commemoration ceremony was held in Oscar Dunn's honor in Congo Square. Thomas Morris Chester, a longtime friend of Oscar, who was an esteemed African-American lawyer and former Mm -hmm. Civil War correspondent, shared with the gathered crowd a shocking conversation he'd had with the late lieutenant governor. That Governor Henry Clay Warmoth, 
and PBS Pinchback, the very man who had nominated Oscar to run for office and following his death, who took over his post, were planning a smear campaign that they planned to share with President Grant prior to Dunn's death. What were they going to do? Although we know that nothing untoward took place between Oscar and his wife prior to their marriage, Mm. back when he boarded with her and her late husband, Henry and Pinchback planned to make it look as if impropriety had taken place and even call into question whether Ellen's children, whom Dunn had adopted, were really fathered by her late husband, Peter. That is awful. Yeah. That is, and especially back then, that would have Mm -hmm. been one of the worst things that they could have done. Yep. Following this shocking revelation to the crowd, Thomas shared Oscar's reaction to the plot. Quote, His great frame quivered when he received the dastardly message, and though he hurled back a defiance, it was easy to be perceived that the envenomed arrow had reached his heart, where its poison was doing the deadly work. Though infidelity of friends, partisan treason, personal rancor, official indignities, and incorporate insults had made him groan in the spirit, when he meditated over the impending blow that was to include his esteemable and accomplished consort and the orphaned children to whom he had been a father, his great heart burst with grief. And when disease came, his mind, which had been too heavily charged with solicitude for those who were nearest and dearest to him, immediately dissolved itself into chaos or passed to unknown realms, whither his soul soon after took its flight, end quote. Is that just a really long thing of saying he was rolling in his grave? No, it was finding just that out? basically him being like, oh my God, I cannot believe this is going to happen. That's ins- Yeah, it's insane. Like these two people that apparently were so impressed with him and trusted it. Oh God. Yep. That's so awful. They plan to share this information with President Grant before oscar's trip to washington when he went to actually meet with president grant that's disgusting and it came to light that following a visit to president grant pinchback and 19 other men who attempted to gain grant's favor for the next election Mm -hmm. received a rather cold welcome good because grant backed oscar yeah Oscar had written a widely publicized letter that lambasted Governor Warmoth for abandoning the very people who elected him to office and labeled him, quote, the first Ku Klux governor of the party he has disgraced, end quote. Ooh, that is quite the clapback. Yeah. You go, Oscar. (laughs) Oh, ooh. Yeah, this is some dirty politics. This is real dirty politics. Yeah. Holy smokes. Pinchback, who was originally from Ohio, was a mixed race, the son of a white planter and a formerly enslaved mother. He moved to New Orleans just before the Civil War broke out and served a month in jail for stabbing another free African-American in the street. Yeah, why not? He was just standing there, so I thought I put my knife in him. You know, just a little stab stab for funsies. He could just hold it for me, you know? Yep. Following his incarceration... He joined the Union Army and rose quickly through the ranks before resigning due to racist regulations. I don't like this man. No, and it gets worse. Great. Following his military career, he turned to politics and quickly proved to be an impassioned speaker. During a tense stretch of violence against the African-American population of New Orleans, Pinchback gave a speech before the state Senate stating, quote, The next outrage will be the signal for the dawn of retribution, for patience will then have ceased to be a virtue, and this city will be reduced to ashes. End quote. (sighs) I hate this guy. And it continues. Great. Awesome. Given his violent history, many of his peers feared crossing him, especially given that he owned a newspaper called The Louisianian. In his speech in Congo Square... Thomas mentioned an article that had been published about Oscar Dunn without outright naming Pinchback publicly. Great. 
quote, hardly had the tomb been closed over his mortal remains, did the Louisianian, under the immediate and responsible control of a well-known colored man, attempt to rob him of the esteem which was so universally accorded while living, and to blur his memory. Such manifestations over the body of a worthy and lamented citizen indicates a malignancy of heart which would not scruple at any means if the courage were present and interest required it to compass death, end quote. Damn. I, God, this is all bad. You have your own newspaper and you're just slandering. Mm -hmm. Libel. It's libel. It's libel. Yep. I hate him. Thomas continued, quote, Ye who pursued him with such unrelenting fury, go to yonder city of the dead and look upon your ghastly work. I arraign you, one and all, to answer before the bar of public opinion for the moral murder of Oscar James Dunn, end quote. Man. While Oscar's supporters viewed his work as that of a hero, mm -hmm. his white political rivals reveled in his death. I'm sure they did. Many Democrats viewed his tenure as a, quote, perversion of the natural order, end quote. Great. That would lead to the, quote, Africanization of society, end quote. Wow, I haven't heard that several different ways since. Yep. The racism was so bad that some members of the conservative Democratic Party decided to mock his legacy during the 1873 Mardi Gras Ball by having the king of the crew wear a gorilla costume. I really can't say I'm surprised, but it doesn't make it any less shitty and yeah. awful. God damn it. Yeah. An illustration published in the March 29th, 1873 edition of Harper's Weekly shows the King of Commas wearing a gorilla costume, saying, quote, the first black lieutenant governor of Louisiana was an ape, end quote. Cute. Yeah, I found the illustration, and I was like, I kind of want to burn it all down. Yeah. Yep. I will share it on social, but it makes me extremely angry. So. That's horrible. As Nick explains in an article for Tripod, quote, when you see this somewhat rising African-American political star at a time of all this strife, the guy dies and pretty much with him was all of the gains that he had fought for. Mm -hmm. Civil rights, suffrage, integration in public schools, reconstruction started to go away after that. At the same time, the Ku Klux Klan is just getting started. The White League is just getting started, end quote. So instead of the pendulum swinging, the pendulum was, like, knocked back. Yep. That's awful. After his Congo Square speech, Thomas Chester was walking home at night from a friend's New Year's Day party when he was accosted by a group of drunken men who dragged him onto the front lawn of a white woman named Emma Stackhouse. The mob, which was led by none other than Pinchback, mm -hmm. offered Thomas protection. He stated he'd rather die than live under the protection of a man with such loose morals. At which point, the drunken men started to beat Thomas with sticks and knives. Great. Thomas was able to make a break for it, attempting to run onto Emma's porch when a gunshot rang out and he was struck by a bullet just above his left eye. Oh my god. He miraculously survived. No, he did not. Yes, he did. <sighs> and the Weekly National Republican reported that Pinchback had even gone so far as to slap Emma violently on the face before pushing her down her front steps. For shooting him? Just for, like, being there. Because she came out to be like, what the fuck's going on in my front lawn? So he was upset that she was a witness to it. And yep. just great. Wow. Why is this guy around and not dead? Yeah. <laughs> Why does he exist? A warrant was issued for his arrest. But given that he held such a high seat of power in the mm -hmm. government and was the president of the police board, he was never brought into custody. And another member of the mob was arrested in his place for shooting Thomas. Great. And the person that shot Thomas only served two days in jail for the assault. 
Perfect. Great. And Thomas survived and saw all of this. Yep. Wow. Although $10,000 was appropriated in 1871, or around $243,000 today, by Louisiana State Legislature Act 57 to erect a monument in Oscar Dunn's memory, very little, if anything, remains of his legacy in New Orleans. The mansion where he lived on Canal Street no longer exists. No paintings or monuments have been commissioned of him, and the only surviving portrait is held in a private collection in California. Not even the same state. Mm -mm. In fact, it wasn't until 2000 that the Friends of New Orleans Cemeteries had a plaque installed with the brief account of his life on his tomb. Damn. The plaque reads as follows. Quote, Oscar James Dunn, 1826 to 1871, Lieutenant Governor of Louisiana, 1868 to 1871, Grand Master Prince Hall of Louisiana Masons, 1864 to 67, end quote. One of the saddest things about his near erasement from history is a quote from a journalist that was written around the time that Oscar died. It reads, quote, there will be three pictures that hang in the home of every African-American from that day, the day of Oscar's death forward. Mm -hmm. Abraham Lincoln, Frederick Douglass, and Oscar James Dunn, end quote. Mm -hmm. In fact, much of what we do know about Oscar today is thanks in part to his great-great-great-nephew, Brian Mitchell, whose thesis I used as one of my source materials for this episode. Nice. I've linked to it so you can read it if you want in its 296-page entirety. I mean, I I'm sure it would be a fascinating read. As you can imagine, it includes a wealth of other information about his life. Of course. That I just did not have the time to no. include in this episode, or it would have been like a four hour long episode. Mm -hmm. But there are some really interesting things that happened to Oscar in his life that if you want to learn more about him, I encourage you to read it. Yeah. So there's that. <laughs> And it wasn't until July 2021 that the New Orleans City Council honored Oscar Dunn's legacy by rededicating Washington Artillery Park, which overlooks Jackson Square, and renaming it Oscar Dunn Park. Cute. I actually was there. Nice. It's right next to the original Café du Mont. Nice. So that is the life and times of Oscar James Dunn. That's horribly tragic. I'm actually mm -hmm. really genuinely upset that I did not know about him. Mm -hmm. In an article that I read where Brian Mitchell, his descendant, was interviewed, he said that he, when he was in school, because he, he grew up in New Orleans, one yeah. of his teachers was like, hey, is anybody here related to any famous political people? Mm -hmm. And he was like, oh, yeah, my, you know, my great 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 uncle was the first black lieutenant governor and the teacher was like there was no black lieutenant governor oh my god like she didn't even know about him and she was the history teacher or like the like po political science teacher i don't know she was just like an elementary school teacher but like okay. even still it's like i'm sorry what you don't yeah so that's part of what inspired him to write this thesis and look into yeah. his family history because he was like no one knows about him yeah so he bet so he did it right mm -hmm. he was very thorough mm -hmm. good for him i'm sorry he had to do that yeah you know yeah it sucks that he did so much and then it got discredited by white racist assholes it was destroyed overnight Mm -hmm. he was erased mm -hmm. I did read in the thesis and I think in one other source too that following his death his family was basically like destitute like they ended up having to like oh, I'm sure sell their home and all this stuff and people who supported him passed some legal things to allow his widow Ellen to like 
get monetary payment for like what would have been his last paycheck because his term was going to be ending at the end of the mm-hmm. year and all this other stuff. And she did eventually get hired by the city mayor for a position. So she was able to like support her family. But that's good. Thank God for that. But yeah, that would have been terrifying. Yeah. Because they didn't really have life insurance. Nope. Or they didn't. It was expensive and only certain types of people had it. Mm-hmm. We know that it did exist because H.H. H. Holmes <laughs> profited off it. Yep. Yep. I don't think the same courtesies were extended to free people of color, regardless yeah, of sure. their social status. I'm sure. So. Looking for more content? You can find us online at yieldcrimepodcast.com. If you'd like to see pictures from this week's episode, not to mention bonus content and funny memes, make sure to follow us on Twitter at Yield Crime Pod and on Facebook and Instagram at Yield Crime Podcast. On TikTok? Of course you are. Follow us at Yield Podcast. My name is Country Boy from the One Mike Black History Podcast, the Black History Podcast that chronicles little known incidents from African Americans in American history. And this clip is about the origins of Black History Month. Black History Month is the annual celebration of the study and achievements of African Americans. And it was birthed from a time when African Americans weren't being recognized for their central role in American history. Also known as African American History Month, it grew out of Negro History Week, which was the brainchild of black historian Carter G. Woodson. In 1915, Carter G. Woodson and prominent minister Jesse E. Moreland founded the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. This organization was dedicated to researching and promoting the achievements of African Americans and people of African descent. If you enjoyed this clip and you'd like to learn more, join us at onemichistory.com. Anyway, on that delightful note, this week's podcast plug is the One Mike Black History Podcast. Each episode of One Mike Black History centers around little-known events or people from African American history selected for their effect on African Americans and American history. Nice. It's really interesting. It's like a one-person podcast, and Mm -hmm. the episodes aren't very long, so it's really easy to kind of binge it, Mm -hmm. but it covers a wide range of things from like different military groups to singular people and... It's just a really interesting listen. So we'll have a link in the show notes and I encourage you to check it out. Absolutely. And on that note, what's something good you'd like to share? Okay. My good thing is that... (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, you guys. We're having issues with my computer just freaking out and not recording, right? So I'm just going to do this really quick. Okay. My one good thing is that I moved and I really like it and the dog's had a full-blown meltdown yesterday but they're better today and i hope that we get to decorate and have fun and that's that's all i'll update you later okay bye (laughs) (laughs) what's your good thing i was able to get thomas and i tickets to go see the foo fighters in july and i am so excited i have always wanted to see them live I didn't think it was going to happen after their drummer passed away last year, but this is Mm -hmm. like, I think their last tour Mm -hmm. and Milwaukee is the closest place to us where we could go see them. Mm -hmm. Not that it wouldn't have been cool to fly to Germany to see them, but you know, Milwaukee is a little bit closer. So Mm -hmm. you can still get beer in Milwaukee. Beer and cheese soup, hot cheese soup. The only thing I'm nervous about is it's going to be at like a Harley Davidson event. So get your leather ready. I know. I'm like, I'm going to have to like pretend I'm a lot cooler than I am or we're going to stick out like sore thumbs, but it's fine. You should just wear all leather, but like the wrong leather, like the PVC leather Oh my God. <laughs> that like makes noises when you walk. And so everybody's just incredibly uncomfortable by you yep. being there. <laughs> oh, and Joan Jett's going to be playing too. Oh, that's incredible. I'm so excited. It's going to get wild. You should maybe wear leather as uh, protection. Protection, (laughs) yeah. Because it's going to be cool. Maybe I'll bring like a 
bubble wrap suit or something to protect yeah. myself. Buy I come it, home, buy, I'm just like covered in bruises. <laughs> buy a nice Harley Davidson helmet <laughs> so you can mosh with the rest of them. <laughs> exactly. Everybody else is wearing helmets and you just hear kunk, 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 kunk. I'll just hide in Thomas. I'll just be like, wrap me up. <laughs> I don't care how hot I get. Protect me. <laughs> I'm fragile. You are. I bruise easily. Same. Hmm. Like a summer peach. Anyway, <laughs> shall we? Yeah, we gotta shut it down before my computer puts the lights on fire or something. I don't know. <laughs> something bursts into flames. <laughs> All right. If you're interested in ad-free content, consider supporting us with a one-time donation either over on Buy Me a Coffee or our Venmo page, both of which are in our link tree and in the show notes. If you'd like early ad-free content, not to mention some bonus material, become a member of our Patreon today for as low as a dollar a month. A great way to support the show, if you can't do so financially, is to leave us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts, Podchase, or Good Pods, or wherever you can leave a rating and review. This week's comes from our friends, the lovely ladies at Homespun Haints. And they say, old crimes are extra juicy. This is one (laughs) fantastic podcast. Even though I wouldn't consider myself a true crime fan, this show has me hooked. And the research and detail that goes into each episode is phenomenal. Truly a -a one-of-a-kind find. Thank you. It's all Thank you. I'm just here for the ride. It's all year of Lindsay. It is the year of Lindsay. I'm manifesting my dreams. You are. Milwaukee first, PVC outfit second. <laughs> yep. Let's get I'm this coming bed. for you, Dave Grawl. I'm coming for you. So <laughs> <laughs> you like walk up to the stage. He's like, what's that sound? I'm like, I love you, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> is that feedback? No, it's my body. <laughs> it's just me <laughs> breathing. <laughs> you hear like the <laughs> whatever oh I my breathe. God. You're like that guy from <laughs> Hey Arnold who like breathes heavily behind Helga. Yep. The guy with the asthma. Yep, that's me. The asthma <laughs> and the glasses. That's me. <laughs> Got something you want to say? Shoot us an email over at yieldcrimepodcast at gmail.com. We'd love to hear your story ideas, see any gifts you send our way, or if you just want to say hello. We're pretty friendly. Speaking of friendly... If you'd like to have real-time conversations with us, consider joining our Discord over at the Cultivate Network. You can chat with us over at the Old Crimers Cubby, or catch up with any of the other great creators that are part of the Cultivate family of podcasts. Just click the link in our show notes, or over on our link tree to get started today. And on that note, as always, I'm Lindsay. And I'm Madison. And we'll see you next time with another tale, As Old as Crime. Do you ever wonder what was there before Dodger Stadium? Or how hard shell tacos are actually pretty Mexican? Or how about the horrible history behind international adoption in Guatemala? Join us, Carmen and Christina, as we talk about Latin American history, sometimes involving stories about capitalism, corruption, and racism. Sometimes all three. But more importantly, stories about resistance, power, and community. Listen to Historias Unknown, new episodes every Thursday, available in your favorite podcast app and at historiasunknown.com. Weird Distractions is a weekly true crime, paranormal, conspiracy theory podcast hosted by me, Alex. Each week, I tell you what I need a distraction from before diving into a topic to help me distract myself from whatever is going on. My hope is that you too can get a distraction from tuning in and maybe learn something on the way. From haunted hospitals to cold cases and every bizarre online theory in between, there's a little something for every weirdo out there. If this sounds up your alley, then join me every Sunday morning at 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on your favorite podcast platform or search Weird Distractions Podcast on any social media account. Need a distraction? I got you. Thank you.